to another episode of the Alter Your Health podcast, your source of information and inspiration to promote the holistic transformation of your health and the health of our planet. I'm your host, Dr. Benjamin Alter. I'm really, really excited to be with you here today and share this episode with you all. I just got back recently from a trip to New Mexico where I had the privilege and honor and joy of connecting with our guest on the podcast today, and that was Dr. Larry Dossey. Dr. Dossey is an internal medicine physician, former chief of staff of Medical City Dallas Hospital, and former co-chairman of the Panel of Mind-Body Interventions, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, National Institutes of Health. He is executive editor of the peer-reviewed journal Explore, the Journal of Science and Healing. He is the author of 13 books on the role of consciousness and spirituality in health, which have been translated into languages around the world. His most recent book is One Mind, How Our Individual Mind is Part of a Greater Consciousness and Why It Matters. He lectures around the world. So in this conversation, we talk a little bit about the one mind, what that really means, some examples of it. We talk about how this... um, This concept can be used to support the evolution of medicine and the healthcare system, both in terms of supporting diagnostics in medicine and, of course, as well in supporting the treatments in the medical system, Um, because we all know how powerful love and compassion can be to our own individual and collective health. So that's what our conversation is about. Um, It's about the healthcare system, the evolution of the system. Dr. Dossi has been around, so he shares his insights, where things have been and where we're going. Um, It was really a joy and a pleasure to connect with him. Before we dive in, I just want to remind you that um, there's a lot of information on the Alter Health website, alter.health you can get a lot of the notes from this podcast and so much more at alter.health slash podcast. Um, So feel free to head on over and check that out. So also um, would really appreciate any feedback in the form of a rating or review on this podcast, wherever you're tuning in from, would really appreciate that. And of course, also share this content with anyone you feel would be moved, helped, supported, inspired by this sort of stuff. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. And without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy this conversation with Dr. Larry Dossie. First of all, Dr. Larry Dossie, thank you for making the time to be on this podcast. I'm glad you could stop by. I'm looking forward to it myself. All right. Yeah, it's a beautiful home here, and um, thanks for having us. So I'd like to just kind of start things off by, for the listeners out there who maybe don't know your story and how you've come into really pioneer this whole mind-body medicine Mm -hmm. movement, um, how how did it how did it look? I'm still trying it? to figure it out myself. Okay. I uh, was a uh, conventional uh, student in college. I got a degree in pharmacy and uh, worked my way through medical school as a regular, uh, uh, as a registered pharmacist. And I've always had an interest in uh, human physiology. And uh, I graduated uh, in medical school and then uh, went into the U.S. Army, and uh, these were the Vietnam years. I functioned as a uh, field battalion surgeon in 1968 and 69, came back and did an internal medicine residency as a very typical uh, United States physician. Mm-hmm. Then a few things happened in my, my life in terms of uh, having some experiences with premonitory dreams, dreams of things that would happen in the future in my clinical practice. These really got my attention. Uh, And besides that, I had a medical illness which reoriented me about how you approach illness. I nearly dropped out of medical school because of severe migraine headache. 
and uh, nothing worked. This got much worse in my uh, postgraduate medical training, and I thought it might end my career. And then I discovered biofeedback, which is a way of using your mind to change your physiology. This had a tremendous uh, reorienting effect on how I approached human illness. Mental uh, activity, uh, in my own experience, paved the way toward an almost complete resolution of the migraine problem. I began to follow research in this field. I wrote a book called Space, Time, and Medicine, uh, and another book uh, called uh, Healing Words, which looked at the ability of people to use their own intention to affect others at a distance. I didn't even know this body of knowledge existed. Mm -hmm. And it really changed my way of looking at human consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, so I pursued that. Uh, 13, 13 books later, here we are. I have uh, lived long enough to uh, see enormous change in medical education, emphasizing the role of consciousness and intentionality uh, in human out health outcomes. You know, 40 years ago, the conversation that you and I are having now was just taboo. Mm -hmm. You could get into real trouble quick talking about the role of spirituality in health care. Today, it's changed. Almost all the medical schools in the United States now have formal coursework looking at the role of spirituality, intentionality, emotions, attitudes, thoughts, and affecting your health. So we've come a long way, but mm -hmm. we still have a long way to go. Yeah. I, I'm in agreement with you, having you know being on a, on the fresher side of the the doctor <laughs> scenario, um, but yeah, it's amazing to know how medical education has shifted. I'm curious to know a little bit more if you wouldn't mind sharing about your connection with the migraine headaches and yeah. and the healing and the resolution of those. What, right. What was that process? Well, it was disconcerting. I first began to have uh, migraine headaches uh, as a uh, a student in junior high, and I had no idea uh, what the problem was. Uh, I didn't even know what the term migraine at the time. Uh, actually, it was very frightening. I would have periodic blindness. I just mm -hmm. couldn't see, uh, associated with the headache and the nausea and vomiting and really incapacitation. This became a real problem for me uh, in medical school because I didn't divulge in my entry uh, uh, into medical school that I had a medical problem under the stress of medical school it got so much worse that I actually uh, tried to drop out of medical school because I thought it was only a matter of time until I had an attack of migraine with the blindness and I would even uh, perhaps injure a patient or even kill them because I could not function my uh, advisor told me you're just taking this much too seriously it always gets better as you get older. Just relax and don't do anything. Well, I tried that. It didn't work. Actually, the problems got worse. Mm -hmm. And in desperation, after I cycled through uh, my, my period as a battalion surgeon in Vietnam and came back and, and did a, an internal medicine residency, the problem was so bad that in desperation, I chased all around the country when it became known that biofeedback, this new revolutionary technique of learning how to relax using imagery and visualization, uh, it had been shown that people who have migraine who do this report that the migraine gets a lot better. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have any other options that were obvious. No medications had helped. I chased all over the country learning how to do this mm -hmm. as a subject. And to my surprise, in about six sessions, the whole thing almost went away, at least about 90%. I was hooked. And I uh, concluded that it's unethical for me as a physician not to offer my patients this uh, option. And not only did biofeedback help with migraine, there were a lot of, a lot of other problems that responded also, such as irritable bowel syndrome, uh, just free-floating anxiety and stress in people's lives, uh, systolic hypertension, and so on. So I simply thought that uh, this was a, a new uh, era that I, I saw opening up in medicine, and it's uh, shown to, to be that, really. And uh, I can't imagine practicing adequate 
medicine anymore without offering patients these body-mind uh, techniques, which can do things that drugs and surgical uh, techniques are not capable of. Yeah, so in other words, would you define biofeedback for those of you, those listeners who might maybe not don't know it that well? Sure. Is it just a method of relaxation? Or well, is what, it more uh, than it's, that? It's, it's more than that. Uh, you know, you can uh, learn to relax without using these uh, biofeedback instruments, but they speed up the process, the learning process of learning how to get deeply relaxed. For instance, you can put thermistors on your different parts of your body, your head and your face, that measure your muscle tension, and you learn to quiet your muscle tension by getting feedback from the instruments that measure it. You can do the same thing with your skin temperature, mm-hmm. your skin response to uh, uh, electrical connectivity, and so on. And you learn intuitively how to do this by he- letting the machines tell you what you're doing, and it just speeds up the, the process of learning to relax profoundly uh, uh, than people can intuitively do by just sitting down and trying to do it mm. alone. Mm. Besides that, it's fun. And uh, you learn to use images, pictures in the mind to facilitate relaxation. And uh, as you learn to do that, perceived stress and anxiety melt away, you feel better, and illnesses get better. What could be better than that? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm a huge fan of uh, biofeedback therapy. And as a matter of fact, started one of the first biofeedback laboratories in the state of Texas at the time. You know, this new stuff was condemned as oh, some sort of invention of these probably hippy-dippy f- new age freaks out in Southern California. You know, mm-hmm. people really condemned biofeedback up so- at one side and down the other until the data came out showing that this is yeah. this is a substantial therapy. Well, it's amazing that it would be condemned because it is very um, scientific and data driven. You know, you can look at it, you can measure it, you can see it, exactly. you can feel it. So it's it's amazing that that would be condemned. But um, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. You know, I was in a large uh, medical group which I started, and uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues we were really suspicious of this stuff. You know, we had this darkened room back in the office space, and, you know, uh, some of my colleagues actually, th- I think, thought that this was satanic or something hmm. really spooky going on back there. It would never come back and actually hook up to the machines themselves or even look around to see what was going on. But uh, an interesting thing happened. Over the years, many of my colleagues developed their own problems, and one by one, they would come back and turn themselves in <laughs> and say, maybe uh, maybe I should look at this more let's seriously. Let's give this a try. Yeah, let's give it a try. Yeah, I think that's what it all comes down to is just uh, well, slowly, one by one, more and more people are opening up to mm-hmm. what you've been looking at and writing about for decades. Well, there's some truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're, you know, I've, I've always kind of, after being introduced to your work, um, the first book that I read was Power of Premonitions. Mm-hmm. It was assigned reading in the University of Santa Monica's curriculum at that time. And I thought, and we also watched an interview with you maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And I thought, man, this guy is really ahead of his time. <laughs> and, you know, you you're still are, and we're, we're catching up. We're <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I look back, and uh, it's, it's quite obvious that things are changing uh, mm-hmm. quickly with their openness toward issues mm-hmm. of consciousness and the role of consciousness in human health. Uh, if somebody had predicted uh, 20 or 30 years ago that, nearly all the medical schools would have coursework in what we're talking about, mm-hmm. I would have found that difficult to believe. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's maybe I'm interested to know your thoughts around this. Um, you know, to me, I feel like it's one thing to have coursework, you know, a class that you have to go to and take notes and learn. And, and it's, it's another thing to 
live it, to practice it, to know it, to integrate it mm-hmm. into our being. So do do you, I mean, what, what are your thoughts around that? Do you feel like there's a, still a deficiency of it being fully integrated? Well, it's certainly more than an, any intellectual uh, endeavor, uh, getting to the point where you're open to uh, spirituality, mind-body effects and, on human health and, and so on. There's nothing like personal experience. And in that sense, I think I was probably blessed to have an illness mm-hmm. which pushed me kicking and screaming uh, in that direction. Uh, but there are so many options for young people and young physicians now uh, to feel okay about moving in this direction. For instance, there's a huge database. Forty years ago, this almost did not exist. Uh, but how anyone could uh, go through a professional training program in medical school and come out without an appreciation of the effects of consciousness on health, I think is almost impossible. Uh, At best, it's an exercise in willful blindness Mm -hmm. to cut yourself off from this uh, body of information. Having said that, there are still people who think that this is all woo-woo and uh, uh, somehow some satanic uh, incursion into logic and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, data-driven analysis. It's the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. The problem is that uh, culture-wide, we are under some sort of cultural hypnosis to say that everything is material and physical. And I think that there are many doctors these days who will go to their grave thinking that consciousness is made by the brain, produced by the brain, limited to the brain and body, and that that's all there is. Uh, <laughs> we, will, we are living into a time when that idea, though it has recently been prevalent, will be looked at as superstition. Materialism is fading. It doesn't hold up when put to the test. And besides that, we have an incredible database showing that you can use your intentions to influence the health of somebody else. Uh, I tackled uh, this in a a book several years ago in which I coined the term non-local mind. And uh, our ordinary idea of mind is that it's local. It's localized to the brain, the body, and the present and it's stuck there. It can't reach out and do things in the world. But the new data, and there are meta-analyses confirming this, shows that you can influence the physiology of someone at a distance by empathic, compassionate intentions, even though they are completely unaware that you're making the attempt. This phenomenon has been shown to operate not just between people, but between people and animals, plants, even microorganisms growing in test tubes, and even biochemical reactions in test tubes can be influenced by, guess what, your thoughts. Mm -hmm. This moves us from a local concept of consciousness to a non-local concept in which we say that the mind is not localized or confined to specific points in space, such as your cranium, and certainly not to specific points in time. Uh, Experiments by Dean Radin and laboratories all over the world now in a field called presentiment studies show that you can apprehend and comprehend what's going to happen in the future, and this can be detected by looking at your autonomic nervous system function in your body. So... This non-local view of consciousness is built on data and experimentation, uh, not just people's experiences Mm -hmm. and uh, not just on that uh, term that we uh, look down our noses at in medicine called anecdotes. Yeah. (laughs) And I love in your book you you point out the fine distinction between an anecdote and a case study. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like really just a matter of how we hold it in our consciousness oh sure yeah yeah and um yeah and and despite the 
mounds of data and experience and anecdotes and case studies pointing towards everything that you're talking about, there's still, you know, skeptics or... Well, there are skeptics. Yeah. You know, I have a uh, perverse uh, uh, pleasure in life. I, uh, I love to collect quotations from skeptics, which reveal their bias. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, one famous academic engineer who was given a, a study outcome, to a paper to review before publication, and it had to do with remote viewing, people's ability to perceive what's going on at distance uh, without any sensory input. And he looked at this paper. He, he wouldn't sully his mind by actually reading it. He didn't want to, to do that because he knew it was nonsense. So he wrote in a magic marker on the front, this is the sort of thing I wouldn't believe even if it were true. <laughs> so you know that yeah, that that sums it up right that, there. That that really you know, does. It, there, yeah, a lot of people are just really rigid, locked into the worldview that they live in, and there's no breaking out unless no. you know maybe like you pointed to earlier in the in the conversations. Sometimes people are forced, kicking and screaming, right through physical illness, through trauma, traumatic events, you know, shaken up enough so that maybe another perception, another, you know, something else makes its way into our thick skulls. Right. And, you know, this uh, resistance is nothing new. Uh, I gained uh, uh, consolation by going back and looking at the uh, resistance that uh, physicists faced in the early 20th century during the Einsteinian uh, uh, quantum relativistic revolution in, in physical science. And Max Planck, who was the founder of uh, modern uh, quantum mechanics, said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing, uh, science changes funeral by funeral. As if to say there are a lot of people who will go to their graves mm -hmm. swearing that the rest of us are nuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a certain number of people that I think you could just say, they're, they don't want to get it. They will not see it even when it's staring them in the face. And that's just the way things are. Mm. But the uh, flip side of that is that there's an increasing openness, particularly among young people, that what's the big deal? Mm. You know, so things are non-material. Follow the data. Follow where science takes you and put your biases aside. Mm. I think that attitude is becoming much more prevalent, mm -hmm. particularly a young, uh, among young people who are entering medicine. And in that regard, I think one of the main features about the greater openness is the huge number of women that are entering, entering uh, medical professions these days. When I was in medical school, out of 100 uh, students, we had three women. Wow. Fast forward now, the great majority, uh, I, don't, I won't say the great majority, but the majority of medical students in the United States are women. Yeah. And uh, th this makes a huge difference mm -hmm. in uh, the openness toward these ideas about consciousness. Yeah, well, in my program, which is, I, I was in the naturopathic program, and I think maybe it was not quite the opposite, but I was vastly outnumbered by women in my program. And I think um, maybe you could speak a little bit more to this, but why does the the feminine energy, or, the, or why does that open us up, or how does that open us up to a new way of thinking? Well, I have a wonderful opportunity to reflect on that because I'm married to a nurse, <laughs> and uh, uh, she's written 25, 30 textbooks. I, I, I lose, <laughs> lose track. These are award-winning books that are in use in nursing schools around the world, really. And uh, I've had an opportunity to uh, observe close up the attitude of women and nurses toward people in need. You know, I think there's. it's not an accident that that nursing is called nursing because if you look at the etymology of what it means to nurse it's to deeply care for something for someone mm -hmm. and uh i see that innate female instinct to care for people not just in nurses mm -hmm. but in, in in women doctors also mm -hmm. as a matter of fact my wife and i have chosen as our personal internist uh, for the past uh, 20 something years in santa fe a woman uh, who is one of the most empathic, uh, kind, compassionate, and skillful mm -hmm. doctors I've ever bumped into. 
I wouldn't trade her for any fi- a male doctor I know. <laughs> so yeah. w- what's the explanation? I think it's just the natural way women have of approaching the world. Yeah. Uh, much, they're much less competitive, uh, less confrontational, mm-hmm. less imperious, and more empathic and compassionate on average than your average male doctor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's... Did some, I get it wrong? There's some exceptions, maybe, <laughs> Dr. Dossi. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, there, you know, obviously there's some exceptions. There's some w- females who are, have a competitive kind of masculine presence. But, but yeah, the feminine nurturing, nursing, that adjective... Yeah. Or that verb um, that really points to it. Yeah. So I'm curious uh, if we could maybe shift the conversation toward more applicable, you know, how is consciousness applied in medicine? You know, I, in, in, re, in your book, One Mind, you point to a quotation about um, conscious, con- I, I'm not going to get it right, but consciousness being the most nonviolent means of treating yeah. illness. So how is that done? Well, I'll give you an example about how it uh, shows up in medical practice, whether you want it to or not. Uh, it paves the way for people to understand what's going on in their bodies and what health issues they may face in the future in ways that you cannot explain by logic. Mm. For example, I was in my office one morning and i one of my favorite patients uh, came and banged on the door and came in, and she was a, actually it was totally shocking her behavior. She was a, an outstanding attorney in Dallas, mm-hmm. and she said, "You have to help me. I uh, I know I have uh, o- a ovarian cancer, and uh, I'm scared to death." So the story is that she had a dream the night before in which she saw three little white spots on her left ovary. Those were her, her, her words. And uh, she said, I know I have cancer. So we did an exam. It was normal. We sent her for a uh, sonogram of her ovaries to get a picture of it. And the, uh, she told the radiologist what her problem was. I've got three little white spots on my left ovary. And he said, how do you know? And she said, I dreamt it. And he had a big life about that. He said, this is the only sonogram I've ever done as a radiologist on account of somebody's dreams. Mm -hmm. So he put her down, but he did the sonogram, and he was back in my office in a few minutes, white as a sheet, and uh, I said, what did you see? And he said, well, she she has three little white spots on her left ovary, uh, and I had to rub it in, and I said, sort of like she saw in her dream, right? And, uh, but the good part was that these were ovarian cysts, they weren't cancerous, so she got her diagnosis wrong, but she had some sort of non-local knowing about what was going on in her body that she had no business knowing rationally. There were no symptoms whatsoever. This is one way that people can intuit what's going on, bypassing logic. Actually, I gave a talk about these issues to a group of uh, Harvard docs uh, a while back, and I told them my experiences with premonitions as a doctor. And uh, uh, I thought, this talk isn't going well. I don't think anybody, you know, understands what I'm saying. Uh, and I was totally wrong because in the Q&A session, they began to tell me their experiences. Mm-hmm. And this really got interesting. Uh, one female internist uh, stood up among all of these hundreds of docs and said, Well, I get numbers in my dreams. She said, I see the specific values of my patient's lab tests before I even order the tests. And it went from there. And almost all the doctors who stood up and told their stories would introduce them with a similar comment that said, uh, well, I've never told anybody this in my life, but... And then they would go on. And I thought, a lot of people aren't talking. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a social stigma in medicine still about talking about these experiences. We better start talking about them because they can make the difference in life and death. 
Larry Burke, who is an a interventional radiologist, a friend of mine, has collected uh, around 20 case histories of women who discovered they had breast cancer through dream revelations. Almost all these dreams are alike. I don't know why this is, but in the dream there is a uh, father figure, deceased, who comes to them and says, just you you better get to a doc and and have a mammogram done and because there's something serious going on i don't know why these dreams take this form but this is the consistent pattern and so the typical case is that a woman goes to a doctor does an exam sometimes a lump is felt or not but it is caught early enough that the outcome is good uh so there you are. We make a huge mistake in not paying attention to these non-local ways of knowing. Premonitions, anticipation of the future, listening to information that bypasses the physical senses. This is a huge area that we need to capitalize on medicine. Mm -hmm. We neglect it to the detriment of our patients. Mm -hmm. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's you're more pointing towards the maybe diagnostic yes. level, um, which is obviously super important in our in our world today. Um, well, let me take it yeah. to a therapeutic level. Cool. That, thank uh, you. Yeah. And this, I think this data is just unimpeachable. Uh, we now know that people who follow some sort of uh, spiritual path in their life and it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to matter which one they pick mm -hmm. but if they pick one and they stick with it they live on average seven to 13 years longer than people who do not follow a spiritual path and in the process they have a lower incidence of all the major diseases you want to point to, including heart disease and cancer. So they have a longer lifespan and, as I like to say, health span. It's, yes. It's, yeah. it, it, they're healthier yeah. while living longer. Yeah, that's fascinating. Th this is one of the great goals of medicine, to mm -hmm. promote that sort of thing, right? <laughs> I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And here you have people doing it on their own through no help from doctors, but because of these wonderful side effects of following a spiritual path. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked about this data to doctors all over the place, and I find that most docs don't have a real problem because they'll fall back and interpret this data in materialistic terms. Well, people who are spiritual, they may be vegetarians, or they may like to exercise, or they may smoke right. less and drink less, but it's beyond that. Too many variables, so to speak, but yeah. And uh, I think if you really unpack the data, even when people have had some sort of materialistic, let's say, surgical intervention, how well they do at surgery depends largely on whether they're pessimistic or optimistic about how that therapy is going to work. Mm -hmm. After bypass surgery, people who come out of that experience as an optimist uh, thinking positive, uplifting, happy thoughts about how they're going to do. They outlive people who come out of that ex surgical experience as pessimists who are certain it's not going to work, you know. Uh, and sure enough, you see the survival curves diverge tremendously over a three-year period mm -hmm. between the optimist and uh, the pessimist. And you can decide yourself which one you think lives the longest. Mm -hmm. So... It sounds like a, a real opportunity in medicine is supporting people and connecting to this. Maybe supporting people, pre, you know, for example, pre-surgically in kind of setting a positive intention, connecting with a positive feeling. Um, and maybe would you say that's the same, um, in other words, connecting with the one mind? Absolutely. You know, the idea basically that uh, your thoughts could affect somebody else assumes that there are no boundaries between your consciousness and theirs. Mm -hmm. The one mind is built upon this idea that there are no fundamental uh, boundaries between people's consciousnesses. Uh, this may seem uh, uh, a quite 
quite a strange thing to uh, talk about, but I would fall back upon meta-analyses of people uh, and experiments in laboratories and remote viewing and uh, presentiment uh, studies and in uh, so-called distant healing studies in which people can clearly influence physiological processes at a distance. One of the dat- databases which uh, listeners might uh, easily go to to show, demonstrate this to themselves is uh, the work of Bill Bingston, who's a physio- uh, excuse me, a social psychologist of all things, who has become a healer. Uh, he's at uh, a University of New York, and the book is called "The Energy Cure." These are jaw-dropping experiments that he's done, in which you take mice and you transplant breast cancer tissue, mammary cancer, into these mice, uh, uh, and you have a control group that doesn't get the transplant. And this is a terrible thing to do to mice, actually, because within 30 days, all the mice who got the transplanted cancer are dead. There's no survival rate in them. But if Dr. Bingston or one of his students uh, who's learned the technique send their thoughts and intentions uh, to these mice and simply hold these cages in their hands, which contain these mice, they get well. Ninety percent of the cancers fall off. They dry up and just form a scab and go away. Uh, And the control mice that don't get the treatment, they all die. Now, this this sounds weird. It is weird from a materialistic standpoint. Mm -hmm. But this uh, exper- these experiments have been done now on hundreds of mice and around a dozen replicated experiments by him and his group in academic medical centers around the United States. There is no doubt in my judgment that this shows that people's thoughts can change the outcome of serious cancerous illness and other living things. How anyone can suggest any longer that a physician's thoughts don't matter is beyond me. Mm -hmm. I think it amounts to willful blindness of just refusing to go where science is taking us. Yeah. It's amazing to me always hearing stories of people walking into the doctor's office and hearing negative thoughts, maybe a negative prognosis or worst case scenario, and it's always framed in a fearful kind of manner. Right. And... um, Certainly, there's opportunities to frame things in a more positive light. I think that my understanding is that a lot of doctors don't want to instill false hope uh-huh. upon their patients and don't want to and maybe set themselves up for some sort of legal, you know, le- legal thing. What are uh, your thoughts on that? Well, I understand that. And uh, certainly false hope can be uh, engendered uh, if it's if the hope issue is used recklessly. Mm-hmm. Uh uh, but I, I think there's another side to it. I'll give you an example of where doctors go wrong, in my judgment. Dr. Andrew Weil, uh, who's been at the forefront of uh, integrative medicine in this country, told me once about uh, a doctor who engaged in wheelchair practice. So he had, What's he had, a, he had a patient who... Uh, uh, oh, I forget what her underlying disease was. I think it was multiple sclerosis. But she was in his office, and he said, uh, uh, I want you to go out. And she was still walking around with crutches. He said, you're going to wind up in a wheelchair. Uh, there's no cure for this disease. It is going uh, increasingly in a negative direction. I want you to be prepared for it. And I want you, when you leave this office today, go buy a wheelchair. And I want you to practice sitting in it every day, preparing for the time where you can't walk. Now, I don't know what your attitude is, but that sounds to me like it borders on malpractice. Well, it's interesting because it does seem, and I could understand it being well-intentioned, but at the same time, absolutely, I think it borders on the line of malpractice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think some doctors learn that uh, if they emphasize the negative, they're going to stay safe, as you just mentioned. Uh, Mm -hmm. They're not going to mislead. 
better prepare the patient for the worst. Mm-hmm. And if it happens, you know, then the doctor was very wise, could see into the future, and he maintains his self-respect and status. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that uh, instilling hope is mal is malpractice. I think if we're going to err in one direction, it ought to be toward conveying hope uh, toward uh, healing. I really like that, you know, because, you know, obviously, despite our connection with our wisdom and the one mind, we don't know. We don't know the the ultimate outcome. But, you know, granted that we are going to err, why not shoot for the stars? Oh, sure. I agree. <laughs> yeah. You know, for the listeners, I would emphasize a, a book that I'm, I've become excited about. It's a uh, uh, it's called Doctors Untold Stories, hmm. and it's written by an internist in the Wheaton, Illinois area, Dr. Dr. Scott uh, Kolbaba, K-O-L-B-A-B-A, and he went around the hospital and he talked to his doctor colleagues on the staff, hmm. and he said, what's the weirdest thing you've ever seen as a doctor? Hmm. And so they, they wrote up these things about the weirdest thing they've ever seen, and some of them are absolutely whoppers. Uh, I include one of these uh, uh, patient stories, doctor stories, in a lecture I give about uh, spontaneous healing. And just briefly, uh, this uh, woman uh, developed uh, in her teenage years the earliest signs of MS. This proved to be a progressive, horrible disease. She had to drop out of college. She couldn't do the job, do the work physically. Uh, she wound up with an ileostomy, a feeding tube in her stomach, a tracheostomy, recurrent hospitalizations for pneumonia, a collapsed lung, and she was dying. And uh, this gradually worsened over a period of a few years. But in the final stages, her parents and the doctor, Dr. Thomas Marshall, got together and decided there would be no heroics, no uh, resuscitation when she passed, which was predicted to be any day. And uh, what happened on a Sunday is that a local radio station uh, announced that they were going to have a collective prayer in the listening audience to the radio station that Sunday afternoon for all the patients in the Wheaton area who were seriously ill. And they singled out her because everybody knew her. Her case was well known in the community. And uh, so they got a a huge outpouring of prayer. We know that because the radio station received bags of letters in the succeeding days, people describing how that they had prayed. So here's this woman attended by, uh, in her sick room, by two girlfriends who had come to visit her. And she had been curled up in a fetal position and had not walked for for years, and she suddenly heard a voice which said, uh, my child, get up and walk. Uh, She did. She got out of bed, took off her oxygen, for the first time in years, stood up on her own legs. Her mother heard the commotion and went into the room and Apparently, her her physical appearance had changed. The, the mother looked her up and down and said, Barbara, you have muscles again. Her father came in the room. He was astonished to see his daughter standing up. And he hugged her. And as they say in the story, he waltzed her around the room. Mm-hmm. So that night, she went to church with the whole family she walked from the back of the auditorium to the front. The minister did not handle this well. He fell against the pulpit <laughs> and kept muttering, uh, this is nice. This is very nice. Hmm. So the next day, her family took her to Dr. Marshall, her long-term internist. Uh, they took out the ileostomy, discontinued the feeding tube, discontinued her oxygen, uh, sent her for a chest X-ray, the collapsed lung and the infiltrates were no longer there. And the doctor said, I've never seen like thing like this in my life. She was about to die. 
no CPR, no hope for her forever, for, for, uh, at all. And here she is, well. What do you do with that? <laughs> I mean, you I, just put that in the sweep it under the rug. Well, it says know. there are some things that we just yeah. don't understand, yeah. right? I think that's a minimal approach uh, to yeah. it. So, if someone with end stage non resuscitatable illness can uh, spontaneously be cured, I think we should keep our options open about the mystery of healing. Mm. And in view of these kinds of uh, spontaneous turnarounds, I think it's reckless to tell somebody there's no hope. I agree. <laughs> That's a powerful story. I haven't, not, I haven't quite heard one that dramatic, but I know mm -hmm. there are countless you know, others. Um, as you were sharing that story, a question arose in me. Um, curious your thoughts. How do you pray? What is, uh, what is, the, what is a, because that you were talking about yeah. the story of many people praying, what's right. the proper way of praying? Yeah. Well, I, I have a wide open definition of prayer. It mm -hmm. offends a lot of religious people, but I, I just consider prayer to be a communication with the absolute. Mm -hmm. And I leave it up to others to decide what form that communication might take. And also the meaning for that person of what the absolute is. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of religious people will define the absolute in terms of the deity in their particular religion. Others will consider prayer to be talking either to yourself or out loud to what they consider to be the deity. I just want to leapfrog all of those spe specifics and keep it generic and uh, mm -hmm. say that it involves some form of communication with uh, the absolute and leave it up to people to define those terms. You know, one reason to do that is that there's some religions uh, that uh, in which a prayer is very precious, uh, which are not even theistic. There, there are many schools of Buddhism, for example, that honor prayer, but they have no idea of a personal God. They pray to the universe. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't want to rule out one of the world's great religions by getting too narrow in these definitions. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the studies on distant intentionality in which intentionality is expressed as prayer, there is no proof that any particular religion has cornered the market on on prayer effects. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there's uh, evidence that people who use their intentions who don't consider it to be prayer uh, can achieve equal results as with people compared to people who pray in a religious motif. Mm -hmm. So what what's the common denominator? I think it's probably love and compassion and deep, 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 deep caring for what it is or who it is you're trying to affect. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there's probably some common denominator that uh, just uh, transcends all of the uh, divisions and uh, that we make in terms of how we think about religious structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I myself do not belong, for what it's worth, don't belong to any particular religion uh, uh, although I did growing up. But for me, prayer is an attitude of the heart. And uh, I, having said that, however, I, I don't uh, want to persuade anybody from giving up their, uh, their favorite form of prayer. I love that. Thank you. That's a great explanation and definition. Um, kind of guarantee things towards the end here um i'm curious to know some you know piggybacking on this prayer conversation some more practical applications of connecting with the one mind for me and i'll you know preface this by saying for me like my i feel like my connection with the one mind 
is spans far beyond, of course, um, my health and how I feel physically or mentally, emotionally. But it's really, uh, it, you know, uh, you point to it a lot in your book that it's tuning into my intuition, trusting what's coming through me, my the infinite potential of creativity, that sort of thing. So what are some practical ways that uh, people can tune into the one mind for their health and for their well-being? Well, I think it's deceptively simple. Uh, you know, there are traditions, uh, psychological traditions and spiritual traditions who uh, are bewilderingly complex. I think the common denominator in connecting with the sense of the one mind is simply to achieve a an openness so that information from your unconscious kind of trickles and percolates upward to your awareness, to your conscious mind, and that you're willing to engage that. Uh, the question is, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a simple-minded uh, four-step process. <laughs> mm -hmm. First of all, turn off your damn cell phone. A good place to start <laughs> yeah then sit down then be quiet and third just pay attention that's do that that's Dossie's non-religious uh <laughs> simple-minded way of approaching things of course there are millions of iterations on all of that that uh, that is possible and if for some people it's best to dress this up in a spiritual uh, tradition, I, I say go for it. Mm -hmm. I think this is one area where whatever works is uh, uh, pretty good advice. Uh, you know, my one of my favorite poets is Mary Oliver, who won a Pulitzer Prize. She's one of the one of the most widely read poets in America now. Her idea about this is a three step thing. Uh, so she, she shortens says, it even more than you do. Yeah, it's much more elegant than than my four-step one. She says, uh, uh, be astonished, pay attention, and then the third one I really like, go tell about it. Hmm. That's what we're doing here today. We're, hmm. we're telling about it. Yeah, I love that. And I think a lot of people omit that. That next one, if you're astonished and you're paying attention, you want to tell about it. Mm -hmm. It's only natural that you do that. Uh, so I like Mary Oliver's third step. Mm. I think the world needs to hear this. Mm. And I think that uh, it's important for the survival er of our species that people do tell about their sense of oneness with every other human and with all of sentient life on this earth. And uh, I think that's an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that is so important that you realize in your connectivity with the one mind, this is important stuff. I'm not justified in keeping this to myself mm -hmm. as a self-oriented realization. Mm -hmm. I'm committed to spreading the news because I believe that this is the most legitimate way of experiencing consciousness that has arisen. The old materialistic ways, the local ways of uh, regarding consciousness where it's confined to me aren't getting us there. Mm. It set the stage for planetary destruction, selfishness, greed, overconsumption, and the opposite of that is what we ought to be telling about. Mm. So go tell about it. I love that. <laughs> it's what you're doing. That's what we're doing. <laughs> and and on that note, what um, I'm curious to know some of uh, the things that you know at this point in your career, after writing 13 books, I think. Yeah. So, uh, what What's next? I mean, how are, how are you telling about it? I know you're uh, flying around the world and talking to people. Yeah, I have an active lecture but, live. I uh, yeah. I get to go and go around the world and blab about stuff that's uh, <laughs> that. Uh, interests me that I'm concerned yeah. about so that's mm -hmm. my telling about it but uh, I can't I can't not write and I uh, mm -hmm. I'm always working on something else I have a 
manuscript and now that uh, I hope will be published in uh, a year or so uh, of quotations that I have collected for 40, 50 years that have been important to me on my journey. I hope there are over 2,000, 2,500 of these that have to do with the nature of consciousness, how we should exist in the world, issues about environmentalism and, and so on, which I, I trust will be timely and uh, inspirational. So uh, uh, that's in the works. But mainly, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with uh, what I'm, I'm doing and what I get to do. I mean, it's a terrific honor to be in your seventh decade and uh, get to do what you want to do and not have to uh, do anything that uh, is not worthwhile. Yeah, well, I, I would say that we all have that opportunity to be doing what we want to <laughs> well, do. Well, I, I do too. And, yes. um, and what a blessing that what you're doing and what you want to do is, you know, as I see it, really waking up the world. And um, I think that, like, we kind of started this, this talk, you know, slowly but surely, we're catching up with you, Dr. Larry Dossi. <laughs> <laughs> we're waking up and we're seeing things that, that you're pointing to. And um, I'm curious to know, maybe just one, any final words of wisdom, maybe one step for people to take. Um, maybe it's the four steps you already mentioned, but it's one step to put people in the direction of connecting more fully and deeply with the one mind. Yeah, I think that uh, the best guide uh, is your inner sense of uh, uh, compassion and empathy. I think, uh, amidst all the verbiage that we could throw at connecting with the one mind uh, I think it comes down to a matter of love uh, regard for others regard for other sentient species not just other human beings as a matter of fact love is uh, probably one of the most non-local experiences humans are capable of uh, true love gets you outside of yourself when you're in love, you make no distinctions between yourself and the beloved. So if people want to guide about where they stand, I think they ought to check out their lovingness toward others and uh, let that be the standard that guides them. That's great words. <laughs> great place to start looking at love. Well, thanks, Larry. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a real honor and pleasure. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah, and peace and love. and. Until next time.